All right, everybody, welcome to Frontier Tech. Another H2B update this week. This is an H2B week. I'm gonna come back to some family stuff um, next week. Uh, it's just it's just H2B peak season, so that's why I'm talking about this. So today, I'm going to give you kind of a full update about what we know now after the uh, conference with the Seasonal Employment Alliance, what we know about the April cycle, and what you need to be thinking about as an employer uh, to do right now um, for workers, uh, whether you've already had workers or you're recruiting them for the April cycle. Some really good information in this one. I'll see you after the break. All right, guys, so here, here's the outline for today's talk. Uh, I'm gonna talk about application numbers for October 2021, the cycle that just passed, and the possibility of additional visas being put out as of uh, the filming of this, which is December 8th. This is probably coming out on December 9th. Uh, we're gonna talk about the April cycle, how many applications we expect, when the filing dates are, and what we can expect uh, on that cycle for 1A, uh, additional visas being handed out, to delays in and workers actually arriving okay and that's going to be a really interesting discussion uh because there's a lot of things going on globally that that affect us right here you know that affect us right here one of the things that i'm going to break out on that is just uh covid19 you know how is covid19 vaccine mandates how are those mandates and uh the testing requirements going to impact delays and i'm going to give you a bottom line on delays actually i'll tell you right now so you don't have to watch the whole video i think we're going to see a two to three week delay uh because of covid19 issues because of infrastructure issues at ministries of labor abroad and consulates uh, that process the, the visas themselves, I think we're gonna see a two to three week delay on workers arriving this year, even the ones that are slated to come April 1st. That's a preview. But now let's start with the agenda. Item one, let's go with the first half of the cycle. Remember H2B visas have a fiscal year cycle that runs from June to June. The first half of the fiscal year, 33,000 visas are allotted. The second half, another 33,000 with the possibility of additional visas being authorized by the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and typically what's, what's always happened when we've had additional visas, they come in the second half of the fiscal year. So meaning for the cycle of workers coming in on April 1st. This year for the first time, we had this bum rush on the first half fiscal year cycle in October. We had actually 24,000 more certifications certified by the Department of Labor than there were visa slots. 24,000, to give you an idea, we've never, we've never been you know, even near a few thousand uh, over subscribers in previous years. It truly was historic. We saw 100% rise year on year, as I've talked about here before. So what's happening? Well, we've been in talks by we, I mean, the Seasonal Employment Alliance and H2B employers, law offices, uh, agents, uh, the stakeholders have been in talks with the Department of Labor and DHS to try to get a further release of visas. Right now, the political situation is this. The political situation is that the Department of Labor is not wild about the H-2 program. That seems paradoxical. Why not? The Department of Labor, uh, under the Biden administration, has a strong pro-labor, pro-union contingent. And what that means in the American context is that they think the H-2 pro program is actually uh, somehow competing with American jobs, even though it's not. And we can talk about that in a new video. The Department of Homeland Security is a lot friendlier uh, this time around than under the Trump administration because what they want to see they want to see a, a release valve for undocumented immigration um, and they want to see uh, the immigration uh, programs, jobs programs like the H-2 actually used to, to relieve uh, pressure on American employers as, as the system's uh, uh, designed to do. Under the Trump administration, just as a note, we had a completely opposite scenario where the Department of Labor was quite friendly to the program, but the Department of Homeland Security was not because you had a very, 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 very strong Stephen Miller stance against immigration. Everybody knows what that is. Okay, I don't need to talk about it further. So it's just interesting that we now have a flip. The good thing about that in the Biden administration is that the Department of Homeland Security has the jurisdiction to release additional visas. That's why we actually saw a release last summer. It was the Department of Homeland Security, uh, Secretary Mayorkas releasing the visas. And so what we've heard uh, is that the Department of Labor was really 
adamant that no more visas could be released until they finished certifying all applications, which basically went through the start of uh, December. This was interpreted by many as just a slow walk uh, maneuver by the Department of Labor, who again is not friendly to the H-2s. Um, and so now that that's over, the Department of Homeland Security is saying, hey, we think we have jurisdiction, we think we can release more visas, and that's that's kind of where we're at. So we're evade, awaiting a possible very good announcement this week or, or, or next week about the release of visas. Um, the SEA Seasonal Employment Alliance is asking for anywhere for 12,000. There were 24,000 additional certifications. We think that at least half of those are probably not needed anymore. Again, these are seasonal employers. So 12,000 is, is what's being asked for. If that happens and you were certified last cycle, and let's say you still have a need, maybe you even have a one-time need, you know, you're gonna be able to apply with those certified applications to get new visas. So that's really good news. Okay, so let's go out to the April cycle and we'll and I told you about the October cycle first because there's an important implication there. April cycle we're expecting uh, about 130,000 visa applications. So the SEA through its partners, including, you know, um, just did a survey and they see about a 40% increase in, in, in requests. That was my prediction. You know, I said, we're gonna see around 130,000 applications. That was my pre you can go back to the videos I keep saying. What this means is that, you know, to get into group A or B, you got about a one, one in three chance, right? To get into group A or B, which are, which are the groups where you know A is totally safe and getting visa numbers, B is partly safe because some people in, a, in group A don't make it. So we got about a one in three chance down to about a one in four chance, okay, of, of getting through the cycle and actually getting a good lottery number. Again, January 1st through 3rd are gonna be is the window for putting in applications. It's not first come, first serve. It's you put it in during that window. Everything is randomized. And then you're randomly assigned to group A, B, C, D, you know, okay. And uh, we should know by the end of that week, the end of that week is January 7th. The first is a Sunday. It goes, uh, so, no, seven, seven, six, five, seven, six, five, four, three. Two, one. The first is a Saturday, so it's gonna be a Saturday, Sunday, Monday filing, right? So get ready to use that weekend for filing if you're doing it on your own. And we should know by Friday what the groups are. It will be announced on the um, uh, on the Department of Labor OFLC site, okay? But what's happening with the H2Bs? Well, um, what's happening in the April cycle is we have, we have this global pandemic and supply chain um, shortage that's been caused by that and the need for you know new COVID-19 protocols that is going to cause delays you know uh, the H2Bs you have to understand uh, are, are one half of the H2 uh, uh, program the other half is the H2As these are the agricultural visas agricultural visas are not on a biannual uh, cycle you can get them all year the estimated demand this year is 17 percent over the demand over the number of visas requested last year last year there were around 320,000 visas so it's around 400,000 agricultural visas that are being requested okay so if HTV program has 66,000 visas plus whatever the additional visas are so let's say it gets us to 100,000 visas you're looking at a half million seasonal workers that are going to be trying to enter the United States mostly in the spring and summer Half million workers, just think about that number and think about all the attendant things it might mean for the state of the US economy and how we're, we're fundamentally restructuring our supply chains, okay? But then think about the actual nitpicky infrastructural, uh, uh, infrastructural uh, uh, consequences that that has on, on, on border uh, crossers. Right, so you need, let's say 70% of our H2Bs are coming from Mexico. That's about the right you know, percentage, another 9% from Jamaica, the rest from Northern Triangle countries, you know, South Africa, a lot of horsemen, a lot, a lot of horse raisers from South Africa, and then, and then the rest of the world, but 70% from Mexico. So 70% of 500,000, uh, if, you, if, if, you, if you do the math, is just over 300,000. So all those people are gonna have to cross the border, probably on buses from, the U, from Mexico to the US around the same time. There's already a crush at the border of Mexico with asylum seekers coming up uh, from Central America. There's already a crush and a need for buses and trucks elsewhere in the country because like every country, Mexico has supply issues and they're, you know, they're needing to figure out new ways to get goods across the country. Like we use our trains for delivering oil you know, everywhere and it, it leaves fewer trains for farmers is just an example. Anyway, we're, we're, they're already rerouting the buses. There's asylum seekers and not throw in, you know, 300,000 workers coming from Mexico, again, half a million from the world trying to enter the United States, these seasonal workers. There's gonna be a bus shortage. And so there's gonna be a delay in getting from point A 
you know, your your the country you're recruiting your workers from to the United States. You also have to figure out, okay, the, you have to you also have to figure that the ministries of labor in these countries, some of which are responsible for recruiting in other places, private agencies do all the recruiting, but they have to find all these additional workers. They don't necessarily have enough infrastructure in place to do that. Mexico is very well developed. Jamaica is very well developed. South Africa, to an extent, is very well developed for specific things. Northern Triangle is not as developed. So recruiting is going to take longer, you know, if if the Ministry of Labor is responsible for, for, for that part of things than it might otherwise do. And the, the smaller recruiting agencies, you know, might have a tougher time get, getting these larger numbers. And then, uh, on top of that, you have to actually have to do the visa processing at the consulate. So Ministry of Labor recruits the workers, consulates, you know, process these workers, U.S. consulates. Um, again, some countries have very well developed systems for group processing. Mexico's, you know, has has decades, of, if not more, if not a century of experience doing this, right? Jamaica has lots of experience doing this. Other places don't, you know. Uh, just not as much. We hear that Honduras is, is getting better, right? That there's been a lot of work that USAID has been working with Honduras and Guatemala, for example, to get these things moving. We heard from the uh, El Salvador ambassador on Tuesday saying that th this country is really excited about the program. But listen, it's going to be tough. And so between visa processing delays, recruitment delays, and then just delays of like finding buses, you know, you can already see, you know, a week or more delay developing there. But the other element here, of course, is COVID-19. So there's a requirement, anyone entering the United States has to be fully vaccinated with the WHO, World Health Organization, or CDC, Center for Disease Control, uh, approved vaccine. So that's the J&J, &J, the Pfizer, the Moderna. J&J, &J, you can take one shot, Pfizer, Moderna, two. We're not yet at the three shot stage, right? Or two shot if you're J&J. And also China's Sinovac is also now approved by the WHO. Uh, uh, other countries' vaccines like Russia's Sputnik is not approved. So you can imagine that even if workers, you know, they're recruited by the Ministry of Labor, they're approved by the State Department through the consulates, they now have to enter the border. The CBP is the one checking these vaccine cards, okay, not the Department of State. So you might think you have an approved worker, but they come to the border and uh, maybe they don't have all the right vaccines. Maybe they have one Sputnik uh, non-approved vaccine, one Moderna vaccine they might be turned away or, or forced to go get a vaccine before they can cross over. Um, you might have workers who just don't have good documentation even though they have all the right vaccines. Okay, so that, that could cause some sort of unexpected um, uh, unexpected developments, you know, in your workers are arriving. So throw on another week to get like half a million of these folks from across the world processed and just expect that some of them won't come over, okay? So these are the challenges. So what should, what should you be doing as an employer? Number one, if, if you are thinking about not using a recruitment agency, I would strongly recommend that you, that you think about it, okay? I'm recommending all my clients to have an agreement with a recruitment agency signed just in case. OK, uh, even if they think they're going to do it themselves. Uh, number two, if, if you're really not going to use it, you have to tell your workers right now, go get vaccinated. If you have workers that are here that are leaving to come back in another April cycle, have them get vaccinated before they go, probably with a Johnson and Johnson, right? Because that's one shot and you have more of a chance of getting that done than getting two Moderna's or two Pfizer's, right? Because there's three weeks, you just don't have it done. But if they're already back in their home country, call them one by one and be like, you have to go get vaccinated now. And I would also recommend, because you have to have a, a rapid test done within 24, before 24 hours before you enter, um, have them buy you know, over-the-counter rapid tests so, so they can have those in their pocket and, and, and have proof of that test when they're crossing the border. If you do that now, you should be ahead of the game, but I don't think you have too long. I think you have a few weeks where you have an advantage, okay? So all in all, I'm thinking, bottom line, there's there's definitely going to be delays in entry, uh, you know, up to two weeks, maybe longer, and maybe some unexpected surprises if your workers aren't vaccinated. Again, at Frontier Tech Law, we're making sure to work with recruitment agencies that already have pre-bought tests on hand that, uh, you know, are finding and, and, and screening workers for full vaccination, okay? Um, all throughout this process, it has paid off to be conservative. You know, we're learning these lessons as we go. H2B has, has been one of the bumpier programs in, in, in modern history for immigration. But um, I, I think you can be prepared. You can anticipate things, but you have to be active. You know, you have to be, you have to be up there with eyes open. Okay? So if you thought this was helpful, hit subscribe. If you'd like to be added to our newsletter or whatnot, email me. Info at Frontera Tech will add you to our newsletter. Um, and I'll put some or all of this information uh, in this uh, description. So I hope that helps. Take care. Talk to you soon.